Hello Otter Class, I am missing you all so much, I hope you're okay. Now, I know lots of you are really excited for this video. This was our class novel last term, The Whale Boy by Nicola Davies. And we were enjoying it so much, but unfortunately, when we left school, we hadn't quite finished the story. We got up to chapter 20. So I'm going to take this opportunity to record me reading the last part of the story for you, um, so that you haven't missed out. Now I know it's been quite a while already, so I thought I'd just start by doing a quick little recap of what had happened so far, so that it's easier to, to kind of understand what was going on. Okay, so if you remember, this story was about a boy called Michael, who loves the ocean and loves boats. Um, and he's always dreamed of seeing a whale. But unfortunately, just like his parents, whales haven't been seen for years. Okay, and he remember he lives with his grandma. Now Michael then met a rich man called Spargo and Spargo said to him, look, I'll give you a boat and I'll pay you if, if you can just do one thing for me. If you can go out on your boat and go and hunt for any whales or dolphins and any whales or dolphins you see, um, I'd like you to write them down in a notebook and tell me whereabouts they are. Michael thought, hmm, okay, that's fine, I can do that. That'll be a fun job for him and he gets a whole boat out of it but there's one sort of rule and Michael was told that he was not allowed to tell anyone where apart from Spargo where these whales and dolphins were found and that it was a really big secret um, Michael found this a little bit weird but carried on okay so he went out for a few trips on his boat and eventually met a whale and him, Michael and the whale, who he named Freedom, created a really nice kind of bond. And it, it showed like Freedom really trusted Michael. Um, and it was yeah, a really, really special few moments where they'd met. Okay, so Michael was then told by Spargo, um, okay, so you, you, found, you found some whales. Um, I want you to take me out on your boat and show me where they are. So Michael took Spargo and his kind of worker called JJ, this kind of quite suspicious lady, who remember turned out to be his mum, um, took them out to the sea, to the ocean, and he showed them where they were. Um, and then unfortunately, Michael discovered why they wanted to find, find the whales and he discovered that he wanted them to capture them, to put in his museum exhibition, to put them into a little tank, um, but also to kill the whales for their meat to eat them. So obviously Michael was really, really upset by this. Um, Spargo and JJ felt they couldn't trust Michael anymore and felt Michael was going to do what he could to stop this from happening. So they tied him up to the boat and left him to sink. Okay, so that was a really sad moment we went through and we read that, didn't we? But then, if you remember, um, so, so, Mr. Joseph and Eugenia came and saved him. Okay, now once he was saved, he knew that if JJ and Spargo found out he was alive, they would probably try and capture him again. So he stayed undercover and he's gone to move into Eugenia's house. Now, once he's moved into Eugenia's house, he has he decided, I want to go and see Freedom. I'm, I'm going to go and see her um, at this exhibition centre. So Michael had to think of a way to disguise himself and he decided to dress up in Eugenia's clothes. So he put a skirt on and a top, um, a little straw hat with a ribbon um, and decided to walk to the exhibition centre. Um, and when he got there, he was really, really sad at what he saw. Okay, so I'm just going to remind you, we have read this bit before, but I just want to remind you how Michael felt when he saw Freedom in the Tank. <clears throat> okay, so instead of slow, majestic spouts, these were short, nervous breaths. Freedom was bobbing up and down in the water amongst the dead squid that floated around him like so much trash tipped into a dirty pond. The tank was huge, but still little more than three times the length of the whale's own body. And as he was so young and would grow every day, so every day that space would shrink. Never before had the whale known any boundary except the ocean bed and the ocean surface. His movements had been limitless. 
In the sea, he had owned all the space around him from shore to horizon and back again. Every breath had been taken at his own pace, as if he knew he was part of everything around him. That, Michael recognised now, was the source of the peace that radiated when they had met in the sea. Okay, so Michael's really upset because he's seen freedom put in this, in this really small tank. Um, and obviously he's been used to seeing freedom in the ocean. It's like limitless. He has so much space. Um, so this is really upsetting for him. Um, also in this chapter, this is kind of the last bit we got up to. Um, if you remember, Michael kind of took a moment while he was at the tank and looked around and saw all these visitors of the exhibition centre, all these people staring around at the tank and he couldn't understand why they were smiling and laughing. Um, he thought it was absolutely cruel and, and unfair and obviously he'd seen freedom in this, in this happy life in the ocean. Um, he just couldn't understand why people were enjoying watching a captive whale. And then if you remember, after that kind of moment, the chapter ended like this. Okay. <clears throat> On the other side of a circle of seats, close to the exit, a man stood staring down at the whale. He seemed almost on the point of tears, and then he turned away sharply, replacing his sunglasses, and disappeared into the deep shadow of the doorway. Michael wanted to call out, but the man clearly didn't want to be noticed any more than he did. Michael's heart jumped around in his chest. Even under the beard and the sunglasses, he had recognised his father. Okay, so Michael, we thought he was about 11 or 12, didn't we? So Michael's lived all this time and um, since he was very, very young, his mother and father left him. So in the space of a few days, he's obviously been told JJ, this kind of, this lady that works for Spargo, um, is his mother. Um, and he's unfortunately doing a job that he, he really doesn't support. Um, and he's also just seen his father. Okay, so this is where we were up to. So we we're up to chapter 20. Um, so the rest is a surprise, okay? So, let's go. <clears throat> okay, chapter 20. Everything about Rosetown was getting brighter and louder as Carnival approached. Michael walked through the bustle and noise of the streets in a daze. He had seen his father for the first time in almost seven years. He wondered if Samuel would even recognise him now. Certainly not in a skirt and a pink t-shirt. If he hadn't felt like crying, he might have laughed. He leant against the shady wall of the supermarket on Wild Street and thought, there were two places where he might find Samuel again. One was Catspaw, visiting Soso. But Soso wouldn't be there today. He was going to see how the land lies what is the word on the street? Mr. Lubert or any of the guys on the beach would tell Samuel that. The other place was Grand's house. Was it really so dangerous to go there? Spargo and JJ thought Michael was dead, so they'd have no reason to be looking for him. All the neighbours had jobs, so there would be no one out about this time of day, and anyway, all sorts of strangers could be found wandering around the island at carnival time. He decided to risk it. He pushed himself away from the wall and began to run, and then he remembered. It was Michael who ran everywhere, not the gangling girl in the pink t-shirt and the skirt. He slowed to what he hoped was a demure, though fast, walk. He took a long route through the back streets as the old town road felt too exposed, and then through the botanical gardens, up Garth Hill and out of town, cutting back through the banana plantation behind Grant's house, moving between the trees, He was just about to climb over the rickety fence beyond Grand's grapefruit trees when he heard voices in Fro's, crouching behind a thorny bush. Anything? It was JJ. Michael shuddered at the sound of her voice and peeked fearfully between the leaves and flowers. She was perched on the edge of the bench on the veranda, not in jeans this time, but an elegant white suit and large film star sunglasses. That's your mother, he told himself but he didn't feel there was any truth in the words. Spargo emerged through the door, unfolding his chunky body from the tiny cramped interior. Not a thing, he said, and sat beside her, pulling a pair of disposable gloves off his big hands. Nothing at all that could connect you with the lad. No pictures of you, nothing written down, so your identity is safe. JJ sighed and adjusted her glasses on her nose. 
good, very good, she said in her usual business-like manner. I'll make sure the birth certificate goes missing from the registry office and my people in London will take care of his father as soon as they can track him down. The old woman will be dead soon anyway. Spargo looked over at Grand's garden. Nice little spot here. Hmm, I don't like it much as a young woman, JJ said. By moving to the place as a business opportunity. Well, in five more days, your opportunities will be opening up, said Spargo. We'll have enough whale meat for the first shipment and there'll be many more to come and many more whales and dolphins to put into the exhibition centre. I'm starting to build three more tanks next week. And in time, we can expand the business, JJ said. All sorts of things can be smuggled in and out of Rosetown with the whole population depending on us for their jobs. She got up. Let's go. I need to make sure our carnival float will help keep everyone friendly. And I'll need to be on board the Ahab shortly. We must be in position by tomorrow night, according to the medallions. But first, Spargo said, I think you need a spot of lunch, madame. Come along. Margot heard, sorry, Michael heard their footsteps going down the, going down the steps. Car doors slamming, the growl of an expensive engine, and then silence. He let out the breath he'd been holding and tried to take in everything he'd heard. What was all that about people taking care of Samuel? Did JJ plan to kill his dad? It all chased around in his head like a pack of barking dogs. What should he do now? It was hard to think. Get some of his own clothes, that's what he'd do. He wasn't going to wear this wretched skirt and t-shirt for much longer. There was nothing but the distant scribble of sound from town and birds peeping in the treetops. No cars approaching, no footsteps. Cautiously, he climbed the fence and approached the door. Spargo had turned Gran's neat little house, where everything had its place, as Gran has always said, upside down. Every, every cupboard had been emptied and every drawer overturned. Gran's old feather mattress had been slashed down the middle like a possum ready for the spit, and her small store of clothes thrown onto the floor. It was almost the last straw, and for a moment, Michael wanted to wrap his hands around his head and wail like so-so. And then he remembered freedom and his desperate, shallow breaths. <sighs> and his father's face disappearing again at the exhibition centre. No, no, he would not give in. He would not be afraid. He would get to the bottom of this. Gran would be well. His father would be found. Freedom would be freed. And his family would not end up in these and the little plastic packets. Michael threw Eugenia's hat onto the floor and began putting things back into cupboards, slamming drawers and doors shut, stamping around the rooms. In fact, he made so much noise that he didn't hear footsteps on the path or the screen door opening and closing. Michael? Of course he knew the voice instantly, even after all this time and just as instantly realised he was still wearing the shirt and pink t-shirt. They're Eugenia's, he said, even before turning around. I had to disguise myself, so Spargo and JJ, he trailed off when he saw his father's face. He doubted if Samuel had even noticed what he was wearing. His legs felt like rubber and he sat down without having planned to. His father came and sat beside him and for a while they just looked at each other. Dad's bright open face had clouded. There were wrinkles, lots of them, and streaks of white in his hair and beard. Michael knew that his dad must also be counting up the changes in the sun he hadn't seen in so long. When at last they spoke, they did it at the same time, and it took a few attempts to stop overlapping. You know who JJ is? Samuel managed to get out. That confirmed it. It was true. A wave of lightheadedness washed over Michael. He couldn't speak and had to nod his reply. His father let out a long breath. It's not safe here, son, he said. I've got a car parked on the other side of Garth Hill. Let's go. Dad was different. Harder. Quicker. And his voice had almost lost its island accent. He sounded English now. Like JJ. Like Spargo. Can't we clean up here? Michael asked. Samuel shook his head. No, they may come back. So he already knew about Spargo and JJ. There were a hundred questions on the tip of Michael's tongue, but his dad hustled him out of the door. Grab what you need, son, and then we can talk somewhere safer. Samuel's face was closed and anxious, almost the face of a stranger. I don't want you mixed up in all this, but it looks like you already are.
Okay, chapter 21. The car was a Jeep with tinted windows like those on Spargo's car. Dad had never had enough money for a car when he lived on the island, but now he drove the Jeep up the mountain roads and tracks as if he'd been born behind a wheel. He frowned at the road and didn't speak. They drove up tracks that got rougher and more rocky and finally ran out in a clearing. A tiny cottage stood with its back to the forest. Beside it, a stream from the deep volcanic heart of Morn Matin bubbled and steamed over the rocks. Samuel got two cold sodas from the fridge and then they sat together on the veranda, sipping their drinks in silence. I owe you some explanations, Samuel said at last, but it's hard to know where to start. Gran's voice popped into Michael's head. He looked sideways at his unfamiliar, familiar father and said, Remember what Gran always says when you've got something to say? Come on, spit it out! His father smiled, and it was a bit more like the old smile, the smile that made him dad again. He nodded and took a deep breath. Josephine left right after you were born, he began. We'd been together for less than a year. Everyone knew what her family did in England. Big time dealers, mostly. I hoped she was different, but she wasn't. She went back to the business, only ever came here to be out of the way of the police for a while. He shook his head. I was young and foolish, and she was very pretty. What can I say? Samuel sighed and went on. Anyway, a few years later, your Uncle Davies got in touch out of the blue. First we'd heard from him in years, although I'd always make sure Ma got a card from him for Christmas. She never noticed that they were posted in Northport. He grinned suddenly. He wasn't a taxi driver, but he was working as a driver for Josephine. She had taken over the whole business, killed quite a few of her own relatives, it seems, and managed to make the whole job look legal so nobody could catch her. JJ was making a lot of money. Samuel told Michael, but she made enemies too, so he wasn't surprised when he heard that Davies had been shot. I never told Gran. Couldn't bear her to know that her son had come to such a bad end. That's why I went to England, to find out what had really happened. But when Samuel arrived, he found the British police waiting for him. They told him that JJ had had Davis killed. They wanted his help in exposing JJ's criminal job. So he agreed, he agreed to train as an undercover policeman and pretend to work for JJ. She didn't want to be my wife, he explained, but she did seem to trust me enough to employ me. I know now that she was just after the other half of the medallion all along. His father was an undercover policeman. Michael could hardly take it all in. Samuel smiled at the look of, the, of his son's face. Bit of a change from being an island fisherman, he quipped with a fleeting spark of his old warmth. But the pay was better. I never expected to do it for more than a year or two. He went on with the story and Michael tried to get over his astonishment and remember to close his mouth. <laughs> the more Samuel found out about JJ, the more he wanted to stop her. I became involved in the whole setup. I just couldn't come home to you and Gran. His face looked closed and sad again. I was afraid I'd be putting you in danger, even if I replied to your letter. Pretty soon JJ got together with Spargo. He's an old fashioned villain. Would have been a pirate if he'd lived 200 years ago. He'd disappeared from London for months and then pop up again. All that time, I think they were planning this operation in Rosetown. Michael could just see Spargo with a cutlass tuck, tuck, tucked in his belt, making people walk the plank. Spargo owns an illegal wh whaling ship, the Ahab, Samuel went on. He kills whales and sells the meat outside the law and very, very successfully. And just like JJ, he pretends to be a businessman, doing nothing wrong. And then JJ had started asking Samuel about his grandfather's past as a whaler, about the old riddle for finding whales. She's got Davies' med medallion. I guess that much. That's why she had him killed. But I played dumb. I'd never showed her my half when we were married. She wasn't even sure I had it. Never trusted her enough for that. I told her that the whole thing was just a story, Samuel said. And I believe that's all it was. But it made me wonder what she and Spargo might be up to, combining their two businesses. And when they both disappeared, and I had heard about the new marine enterprises in Rosetown, I knew I had to come back and find out what it was. So Michael's father had followed JJ and Spargo to the island, travelling under a false passport given to him by the British police. 
Daniel Poole, he smiled. That's who I'm supposed to be. An IT engineer from South London here for Carnival. Eddie's just me out of the door, I just need to let him in. <laughs> Samuel had received Michael's letter, but he had to keep a low profile, so all he could do was contact the hospital pretending to be Davis and pay grand bills. I rang the hospital when I got to Rosetown, he said. They told me you were missing. I had to find out what had happened, and when I got to Mars and saw JJ and Spargo, I was very glad when I caught sight of you. Samuel took a deep breath, and now I think you might have more pieces of this jigsaw than I have. Michael's brain was whirling. He wanted to lay out the story of the last few weeks carefully, like a map that shows how the rivers go round the mountain to the sea, how roads divide and lead to towns. But it swirled round in his head and wouldn't come into any sort of order. It all just tumbled out. Poor Mr Levi in the little blue boat, taking the job to pay Gran's bills, having to trust Spargo and his promises, finding freedom and the terrible night when he was taken, and Michael finally found out about the truth about his employers. It was hard when he got to the part about freedom being captured because it made him feel so bad and the part about being almost drowned because of the look on his father's face. Josephine is a monster, Samuel said. I'm so sorry you had to find out like that. I'm so sorry I wasn't there to help. Michael saw that he and his father were the same. What hurt them most was not being able to protect someone they loved. As Samuel listened, Michael saw the new dad harder and sharper than the one he remembered. The new dad was very interested in details, like the whale meat packaging and the fact that Spargo's workers were mostly Spanish speakers. He asked what JJ and Spargo had said. Nothing seemed to surprise them. And then Michael came to the hardest part of all, about the moon medallion and how he had given away its secret. Suddenly, the old dad shone out from like a familiar kitchen lamp showing through the cracks in a shutter. Don't feel bad, he said. There's nothing to be sorry for, son. He took the two silver shapes from Michael's hand and fitted them together. Wow, I haven't seen these two together since I was a little kid. I couldn't read when Grandpa gave them to us. Davies never showed me his half of the medallion. For years, I wasn't even sure he'd keep it. Samuel squinted at the words that ran across the moon's two parts. Oh, I must be getting old, he said. Here, Michael, you read them. When Peter hides the devil and the angels kiss, the lions bite, Michael recited. His father shook his head and looked thoughtful. Hard to believe it means anything. Spargo and JJ must know something we don't. JJ's family were once harpooners. Maybe she's got some other information from her family. Eugenia thinks she can work it out, Michael told him. I was going to meet her at the Flying Fish with Soso and Mr Joseph. Could we go? Samuel's face hardened again. Back into new dad and he answered solemnly, well they're already involved just like you are so yes I think we should let's see if we can puzzle this together. His eyes flashed the way they used to out in the boat when they'd hit a big shoal of jacks and then Michael knew that dad wasn't really so different from the old one. All along this new dad had been inside the old one. All along, oh sorry, just as the more grown up Michael had been inside the little kid in the boat. They got back in a jeep and drove down the mountain towards Rosetown. Chapter 22 and most of 23, I'm going to just do a bit of a brief summary to let you know what happened. Um, otherwise this video is going to be too long to be able to upload. Okay, so um, chapter 22, so-so, Mr Josephine, um, Samuel and Michael met in, in the Flying Fish. Um, Eugenia turned up with loads of books. Um, which helped them to understand exactly what the medallions meant. They worked out a plan, what they were going to do. Samuel said it was really important. They did everything exactly to plan um, by timings as well. Um, we kind of discovered in the beginning of chapter 23 that one of the things they'd done was basically inform the village or exactly what the town, Rose Town, of what had happened um, and explaining how they'd been treated in the Wales. Um, yeah, and then it starts to get very exciting. Okay, so the, the town are really against Spargo and JJ. Um, they've now discovered how bad they are, what their plans are for the whales. Um, 
Yeah, and this is what happens. Okay, so they're at the carnival that they've been preparing for. And the microphone appeared in Eugenia's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, she began. Her voice wobbled at first, but only for a minute. She told the crowd all about JJ and Spargo's previous businesses and about their plans for Rosetown as the whaling and smuggling capital of the world about the whale and the whale boy, and the way he and everyone else on the island had been tricked and lied to. Yeah, we could get rich on the trade of blood, Eugenia shouted, or we could turn away and say to the criminals, the murderers who run it, just one word. She turned the microphone to the people and they shouted that word. No! JJ wasn't there to hear it. She was making her way to the airport, not realising that she would not be leaving on her private jet but arriving in good time to meet some island police officers who had changed back into their rather unstylish old uniforms to arrest her. Michael, Samuel and Sosos left the cat's paw in Mr Dringo's boat before first light. Samuel took the tiller, even though Soso joked that he'd forgotten how to steer a boat. They had spare fuel, food and water and were prepared for a long journey. None of them had slept, but they were beyond tiredness. They sat looking out at the grey dawn water, the scattered shapes of walking birds and the line of the horizon materialising out of the dusk. Soso in the prow and Michael with his father in the stern. So that's just part of the boat. Michael gave a long sigh. I hope Soso's right, he said, or I'll be putting you in danger again. We know that Spargo won't think twice about sinking a boat. Will we catch up with them? I don't know, son, he said. If we're on our own, I almost hope not. The Ahab is a big ship and her crew will be armed and used to the worst kind of trouble. Look! Soso's cry broke out into conversation. He stood in the bow, pointing. See, Samuel, my brother, the good word always spreads fast. All along the Rosetown waterfront, little boats were heading out towards them, pulling the silky seas behind them in pleats, one faster than all the rest scooted across the water and drew alongside them. Samuel Fontaine! exclaimed the old guy at the tiller. As I live and breathe, where you been, man? Michael saw Samuel consider telling the man that he was Daniel Poole on holiday from South London, but the thought passed and he smiled his old smile. Oh, you know, around, he said, shrugging. He looked at the young woman in the prow, holding a video camera on her lap. I see your girl's grown up. Hi, Mr Fontaine, said the young woman. Remember me, Louise? I live in New York now, work in TV. So-so promised me a good story. Sam and Sam Samuel and So-so exchanged a glance. You know your course? So-so asked her father as he pulled away. Line up Port Mourne Pierre over Mourne Liberty, the old man called. Keep going and watch out for the rocks, his daughter added. Okay, so that's the positioning in the ocean um, of where Eugenia worked out that the medallions told them to find the, the whales um, and that's where Spargo will probably be heading to find more whales for his tanks. Later, as the sun grew hot, the flotilla of little boats rafted up to share information, food and water. They were almost directly north of the island and it was clear that their course lay out in the channel. The smallest and frailest craft would have to turn back at that point but they still left 52 boats that would cope with rougher seas as long as the weather held fair. Louise filmed some of the fishermen talking. They were a little shy, but quite sure that they didn't want to re a return to killing whales. My grandpa told me all about it, one old chap said. Blood and guts and oil. Horrible. The world had moved on since those days, his son added. Not many countries have whales. We should be proud that we stopped killing them so the whole world can come to liberty and see them. Louise's dad insisted that she turn the camera on him. We may not have skyscrapers and shiny cars, he said with a smile, but we have a green island and blue sea. What is better than that? We are rich already. They set off again more cautiously now. So-so and the riddle were right. The lines were tiny islands, a mass of rocks too, hidden just below the surface. Around them, the water sucked and eddied with unpredictable currents. The sun was sinking, and they were still navigating their, their way carefully through the maze, so busy keeping a lookout for obstacles that they nearly missed the du big dark shape of Spargo's ship on the horizon. There they are, Michael yelled. Quick, we've got to hurry! But they weren't yet out of the lion's mouth and risked the hauling, followed by a rapid sinking. 
The flotilla fanned out to find the best route through, but slow and steady was the only way. By the time they were clear of the rocks and onto the bite itself, the stretch of deep water behind the lines, the light was almost gone and Spargo's monster ship had disappeared. Behind them, Mourn Diablo was obscured by the tall, dark shoulders of Mourn Pierre, as if this was the only mountain on the whole of Liberty. The flotilla drew together again and kept a straight course over the growing swells and the deep, deep water under their keels. Darkness flushed over the sky from the east, and as it seeped down into the western sky, a row of three stars showed, faint but clear, just a finger's width above the horizon. They had found the place and the time. Peter hid Diablo, and the angels shone on the lion's bite, the deep cannon of water that stretched under the stars for miles in every direction. Chapter 24 When the sea around the little boats was covered in gleaming threads and strokes, the whales came up, one after another, and another and another. Their black backs streamed with liquid light, and their spouts exploded into the darkness, like fireworks as their breath carried the mist, misted drops of water into the air. They rolled and bobbed in the water, showing tails and backs, flippers and flanks. In their jaws were huge squid, bright and glowing, so that the whale's eyes caught the light and shone like dots of starlight. The human watchers were transfixed, as if this was a dream from which they never wanted to wake. The otherworldly beauty and magic of what they were seeing removed all other thoughts and feelings, and they forgot themselves in the joy of this moment. The shot of the harpoon gun rang out across the water. Michael came back to himself and turned to see the shock and horror on his father's face in the eerie light. That's the Ahab! Come on, Michael yelled. We've got to stop them hunting them. Engines fired up all around them, startling the whales and sending them back down where there had been glowing backs and jaws. There were now tails, slicing down into the clouds of brightness. The Ahab's lights were clear to see now and the little boat sped across the water towards her. Another shot cut through the night. The approach of the small boats hadn't put Spargo off. Either he thought they were some strange part of the carnival or he was confident that the islanders still wanted the blood money he was bringing. Michael stood up in the prow, leaning forward, and could see how huge she was, her sides rising out of the water like some vast building. The water in front of the ship was alive with spouts. Michael counted at least 20. Further away still were more blows, and tails showing briefly above the surface as the whales went down. At least they would be safe for a while, perhaps long enough to stop Spargo in his track. The ships showed no sign of slowing down, so the little boats fanned out around her, encircling her as they had arranged. Soso took the tiller of Mr Dringo's boat and pushed the outboard to its limit, bringing the boat close to the Ahab, whose crew began to shine spotlights down on them. Up ahead, a whale's head broke the surface with an explosive spout, up from a long squid-feasting dive. Even over the sounds of so many engines, Michael heard the flute-like squeak. It was Freedom's mother. There was a loud bang and the harpoon, its rope vibrating like a demented snake, shot out over the water, captured in the flat glare of the floodlights. It hit her and she thrashed her fork tine tail and arched her body out of the water, spouting blood. Behind the Ahab was one section of the little flotilla had been dropping chains and nets and ropes to catch on the propeller. There was a horrible grating crunch as she was brought to a halt. Everything stopped. The ring of little boats held still, their engines idling. The big ship wallowed helplessly, her engines dead. Spargo's crew were armed just as Samuel had said they would be. They stood on deck, pointing guns and lights out at the fishermen, but no one flinched, and Spargo knew that shooting more than 150 people and sinking 52 boats was impossible. A bright light shone down into Dringo's boat and Spargo noticed at last who had been leading the pursuit. You, he yelled. I should have done for you the same as that boy of yours. Michael stepped into the floodlight beside his father, and Spargo let out a growl of fury like a chained dog. You're finished, Samuel yelled. We know about the whale meat. Interpol are on their way to pick you up. They'll be long gone before they're here. Not with a chain around your propeller, you won't. Bye, Spargo! Samuel turned the boat and drew away from the Ahab. 
the wail, freedom's mother, still thrashed at the end of the rope, though more weakly now, dying. Michael's heart turned over in pity and sorrow. You can't leave, he yelled. He'll just get away. You going to board a ship with an armed crew? Samuel snapped. Michael hung his head. You think I want this, the man who tried to kill my son to go free? Samuel continued fiercely. He's not going anywhere. With a foul prop and the current, they'll be on the lion's bite by nightfall. Hold down below the waterline and sinking. He knows it and his crew know it. What's more, they know the best, best thing they can do is hand him over the first chance they get. If they take to the lifeboats, they'll be picked up the moment they hit land. What about Freedom's mother? Michael cried. There's nothing more we can do for her son. Samuel put his arm around Michael's shoulders. But let's get back and see what we can do for your friend Freedom. They got back to Rosetown at breakfast time after the quietest carnival night anyone could remember. Policemen, dressed in their uniforms, waited on the quay and after a brief conversation with Samuel, set off in a police launch with Soso as guide and a boatload of soldiers to arrest Fargo. Samuel said that as soon as the phones, mobile and internet worked again, he would be too busy to even think. So dirty and exhausted as they were, he and Michael went to visit Gran. She was sitting up in bed in her private room, tiny and fragile as a fairy, but she knew both of them as they walked through the door. She shaped, remember if Gran has dementia, she shaped both their names with her lips, although her voice was too weak to speak. They sat on either side of her bed, each holding a hand. She didn't seem to want anything more than that. Michael thought of the way whales lined up and ready to dive, touching flippers. He felt a connection running from the hand he held in his to the other hand that Graham was holding, a line going through her heart from his to Samuel's. He wanted Samuel not to go away again, but he couldn't ask. But then his father said to him, I won't go back to England, you know. His voice was flat with tiredness. We'll get our boat and we'll go out on the ocean. Michael squeezed Gran's hand and knew that Samuel would feel it too. They watched her face. Her smile was so sweet and her forehead smoothed with the worry lines and creases that had crisscrossed it all the time they were both growing up. When her breathing had changed to the familiar purring snore, they left. I think she'll be okay, Michael said happily as they left the, the hospital. Yeah, Samuel replied. Tomorrow, if I can escape from the paperwork, we'll go up to the house and tidy it, ready for when she comes home. But the next day there was no time for anything. The story of the little island and its fight against big crime became international news. Louise's video of the crazy harpoon man and the quietly determined fisherman was shown everywhere. The shots of the glowing sea full of whales spread wonder around the world. Spargo and JJ waited in jail to be flown to London to face trial and Samuel seemed almost like a prisoner himself, kept working in the island police headquarters all day. Whale experts flew to Rosetown from America, Europe, Canada, India, Australia, everywhere, to try and decide what should be done with the first captive sperm whale on earth. No one wanted to ask the boy who knew the whale best what he thought they should do. He wasn't an expert. He was just some kid. Michael tried to get into the exhibition centre to comfort his friend Freedom, but they wouldn't let him in. He couldn't understand what they were waiting for. Freedom could have been back in the sea by now. He fear, feared that the whale would die of misery before they decided what to do. And after anxiously pacing up and down outside the MEC for a few hours, he gave up and decided to go and see Gran. The walk up the hill would help him to think what to do next. He had to get Freedom released. He would do it. He just had to work out how. It was lovely afternoon. It had rained in the morning and everything was fresh and clean. He breathed deep and let the sweetness of the air soothe him. And the lift up to Grand's floor took ages. He stepped out and knew the moment his feet hit the grey lino, she'd gone. Sister Taylor came up to him, smiling kindly, but he didn't need to hear the words. Chapter 25 she looked younger, more peaceful than he'd ever seen her. He held her hand, but it was cold, like a thing, not a person. Yes, he told the nurses. He would inform her son. He went down in the lift again. At first he thought the throbbing sensation in the air was just his heart breaking, but it was a helicopter flying so low, the vibration echoed through his whole body. The experts must have decided what to do, and now Freedom would be terrified. 
It was a helicopter that had begun his long nightmare. Michael ran all the way past the wooden houses with the sea peeping between, past the public baths, the bakery just opening, the radio station and the Rathbourne Hotel, down to where old Mr Levi had once had a shack and a collection of little boats. He didn't let anyone or anything stop him this time. He simply wriggled out grabbing hands, slippery as a fish, leapt up stairways too fast for pursuers and dived headfirst into Freedom's tank littered with the remains of fish and squid which the whale had refused to eat. The water was rank and horrible, and poor Freedom's skin was suffering terribly. He looked frayed. Without even thinking, Michael swam straight towards him, diving down to reach one universe-holding eye. The whale turned at once, that lovely pirouette, so he could look at Michael with both eyes at once, belly up. And then he rose through the water, catching Michael's body on his left side by the flipper, lifting him as he once lifted the Louisiana May, as his mother had once supported the little boat to keep Michael from drowning. Michael rubbed his hand around the whale's eye. He felt the deep trembling as the helicopter hovered overhead and glanced sideways at the people standing by the tank. He glimpsed their faces for just a fraction of a second, but saw that at last they understood and would leave him be. He didn't look at them again, but kept rubbing and stroking his eyes, fixed on freedoms as the sling was put around them, and together they were carried out of the tank and back to sea. The ocean was so sweet after the stagnant water of the horrible tank, its, lovely as, its touch as lovely as grand smile. Instantly, a shiver of new energy went through the whale. Michael knew that he would be all right. He was weak and afraid, he was back in his limitless world. Did he know already, just by the sound and feel of the ocean, that his mother was dead? Could he sense the horror still lingering there, even at the distance from the lion's bite? Freedom lay on his side, as he had in the tank, with Michael resting near his left eye, just close enough to the surface to be able to snatch a breath every few seconds. The whale seemed dazed, and then he sank just below the surface, he began to click, as if trying out his voice again, and then came back up and breathed. <sighs> Big and slow, in his own majestic time once more. He lifted the curved corner of his snout out of the water, swimming slantwise. Michael remembered that first time, when he thought Freedom was laughing at him. He felt it again now, the whale was telling him. Weird little land creature, let go of your smallness. And for a moment, Michael did. Freedom pushed his square nose against Michael's body, carrying him around like a limp starfish. And Michael felt the hugeness of the whale and its oneness with all around it, the same fluid inside and out, up and down and along. As an adult, male sperm whale, Freedom would explore every part of the blue world, every sea and ocean. He would meet humans, humans like Spargo, like JJ, or just humans too joined to their little land animal smallness to understand no one gains anything from harming a whale. To be safe, freedom must never again be this close to a human being. Would he feel betrayal? Hatred? It wrenched Michael's heart to think so, and to give up for this ever feeling of connection with so great and gentle and alien a being was a grief almost too great to endure. But love was about doing what was best for the person you loved. So Michael knew that in return for all that freedom had given him, there was a small but invaluable gift he could offer in return, mistrust. He fumbled for the silver half moon on the string around his neck, pointed and sharp as a tooth. It was too small to do lasting damage to such a large creature, but it would sting and teach him a lesson that humans could not be trusted. It was hard to see with the tears and salt water in his eyes, but Michael drew back his arm and stuck out with the silver thorn as near to freedom's sensitive blowhole as he outstretched arm would reach. The shudder went through the whale. Instantly he tipped the boy off and turned down towards the safety of the deep, altering his buoyancy with perfect precision. Michael bobbed there on the surface, spluttering, washed in the wake of his tail, as the loveliness of freedom's strange body receded forever into the blue. Oh my god, what a beautiful story! So, so what that taught at the end was, obviously, and this is something that is really going on in the world, um, unfortunately whales are hunted, um, 
can put captive into, into exhibitions or, or hunted for their meat. Um, and whilst Michael had a really lovely relationship with freedom and wanted to continue visiting freedom in, in the ocean, he knew that the best thing he could do for that whale would be to just, it hurts a little bit, but poke him with that medallion um, to, to kind of lose the whale's trust. The whale didn't trust humans because unfortunately Michael felt, and I guess it is true, he created such a strong connection with that whale that freedom was then happy to go um, to lots of different humans and it, it ended up meaning that freedom was captured. Um, so it's important to teach whales that not all humans can be trusted. Okay, now this story um, was written by Nicola Davies and she's actually a zoologist. So she has traveled the world and seen so many different sperm whales. Um, and she says, every time I see a sperm whale again, their strangeness just takes my breath away. They're just so weird. Their huge head always reminds me of the black plastic heating oil tank that used to sit in my parents' back garden. But they are also beautiful. Once a very long time ago, I was like Michael in the water with a group of sperm whales. For the first time, I saw them as they were in their world of water, not just as odd body parts sticking up into my world of air. Underwater, I could see how their squareness tapered to a tailstock that looked as delicate as the stalk of a leaf. They were bendy, like creatures made of rubber, twisting around each other, turning upside down and sideways, moving so gracefully, I was captured. Sperm whales are not only look remarkable, they are remarkable. They are only visitors to the surface of the ocean. Most of their lives are lived 1,000 metres down and deeper, a world more alien us than us to the moon. To do that, they hold their breath for an hour and more and store oxygen in their blood and muscles. Okay, Nicola Davies also says that the threat from whaling still hangs over sperm whales and it isn't the only one. Pollution and climate change could reduce their food supply or affect their ability to fight disease. Because we've learned a lot about climate change recently, haven't we? So we know um, the impact that has on, on sea life. And it says, this doesn't have to be the ending of this story. We don't have to hunt whales or pollute their habitats. We don't have to let them drown in our nets or go deaf because of our noise. We can do things differently. We can change. We can make sure that sperm whales stay in the oceans for long enough for us to work out what they were talking about. Just imagine that. It might mean that one day we humans might have someone else to talk to apart from each other. Okay otters, I hope you enjoyed that story as much as I did. I just want to read it all over again. I loved it so much. Please do, if you listen to this, um, I know loads of you in class are really enjoying this story. I know it's not quite the same as sitting together in the classroom and reading it together. Um, but I really hope this is okay. And please do let me know, email me um, if you did listen to the end of the story and let me know what you think. Okay, I'd love to have a little chat with you about it. Okay, take care. See you later. Bye.